Rufus. In order that I may understand your remarks on this act of the General Assembly, I wish to hear your answer to two questions. One is, what are the peculiarities and the principles to which the members of the Church of Scotland profess to adhere, or profess adherence, different from the principles of the Reformed Protestant religion? For my own part, I am ignorant of such peculiarities, and I know that it has been usually stated as the ground of the Church of Scotland's descent from the Church of England that the profession of the latter with regard to prelacy and ceremonies and religious worship is different from the principles of the Reformed Churches, that the principles of the Church of Scotland are nothing different from those of the Reformed Churches, appears from the view that we have taken of the harmony of their confessions. Churches may have different formularies without any real difference in doctrine, worship, discipline, or government. It is neither said nor necessarily implied in the Assembly's Act that ministers were bound to admit strangers who publicly professed a determined opposition in any of these respects to the principles of the Church of Scotland. The other question is, how a person can be received into regular, habitual, full communion with any church and to an equal participation with the members in her sealing ordinances and yet not be a member of that church? In the late disputes between Great Britain and the United States, we heard a great many florid harangues about extirpation and about the necessity which persons are under of remaining aliens in any other country than that which gave them birth. But the opinion that Christians, not liable to censure either in profession or practice, should remain aliens or strangers and not complete members in any part of the Christian church where they have a stated residence and are admitted to sealing ordinances, appears to me new and strange doctrine indeed. It is true, they are called strangers in the act of assembly, but this seems only to respect to the circumstance of their being new, newly arrived in Britain from some foreign country, or it may be said with respect to their character rather in the state than in the church, in which there is neither barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free. I cannot say I see what necessity there was for this act of the assembly, as I know of no particular dispute between the Church of Scotland and the Reformed Churches on the continent, only it seems probable that it was occasioned by the great resort at the time of the French refugees to Britain as well as to other Protestant countries, and it is well known how agreeable the Reformed Church of France had once been in doctrine and discipline to the Church of Scotland. I may add that there is nothing in the act allowing ministers to admit to their sacramental communion any avowed and obstinate enemy to Scotland's covenanted reformation. Alex. Any answer that I could give to your questions would be only a repetition of what has already been said concerning the confessions of the Reformed Churches, concerning the import of communicating with the particular church, and concerning church hospitality, all which particulars have already been proposed in your consideration. But I may quote a few words from Mr. Dunlop, an eminent minister of the Church of Scotland, in his preface to the collection of confessions. Quote, there is, says he, no act of the assembly, nor even of any inferior church judicator, establishing the confession of faith, a term of Christian communion, and requiring an assent thereto from Christian parents in order to their being admitted to all the privileges of church communion, and further, that no person that acquaints a minister that he is of a contrary opinion in some articles of the confession of faith, that he can neither profess his own belief of them, nor engage to educate his children in them, would therefore be a denial, would be, de would be, therefore be denied access to the sacrament of baptism." Unquote. Such were the views and practice of the Church of Scotland so early as the year 1719 when Mr. Dunlop's preface was published. Rufus. Notwithstanding the eminence of Mr. Dunlop as a minister and writer, I cannot see how an admission of persons to sealing ordinances who refuse their assent to some articles of the confession is consistent with the act of the assembly approving it. For, according to that act, the confession is received and adopted not only as judged to be most orthodox and grounded on the word of God, but as a principal part of the intended uniformity in religion, and as a special means for the more effective suppression of errors and heresies. It is obvious that the confession cannot answer these important ends, while this mode of admission to sacramental communion obtains, for if one person be admitted to full communion without assenting to some articles of the confession, any person may be admitted without assenting to others. A third cannot be refused the same indulgence, nor can be consistently refused to a fourth, a fifth, or to any number that may desire it. On this plan, the confession can be no means either of keeping error out of the church or of promoting uniformity of religious sentiment among her members. 
Mr. Dunlop's motive admission to sealing ordinances is also inconsistent with the solemn declaration which every minister of the Church of Scotland makes at his ordination, that he sincerely owns and believes the whole doctrine contained in the Confession of Faith, and still more with the engagement that he comes under at the same time to maintain the same whole doctrine to the utmost of his power. Nothing but the abominable casuistry of the Jesuits can pretend to reconcile such a profession and engagement of, the, of a minister of the gospel with his admitting to full communion a person who had plainly told him that there were some articles of that confession which he neither believed himself nor would teach his children to believe, articles which he utterly rejected. Common sense and common honesty would say that in doing so, a minister is rather betraying and giving up the doctrine of the confession to its adversaries than maintaining it. After all, it may be allowed that what Mr. Dunlop describes in the words which you have quoted was at the time when his preface was written, was at the time when his preface was written, the practice of too many in the established Church of Scotland, which was then far gone in defection. Quote, purity of doctrine, says a faithful witness who was a minister of that church at the same time with Dunlop, has been the privilege and blessing of this beyond many of her sister churches, but some of her present circumstances render her condition more hazardous and susceptible of defection and heretofore she was wont to be. It is vain to think of preserving the purity of religion in confessions and other standards, though they should remain untouched, while some sow tares and others sleep, while some by their bold and presumptuous meddling corrupt its truth, and others through negligence, the love of ease, and other biases overtook all, and few make it their business to preserve and express its power. It is known that of late years, a root of bitterness sprung up among ourselves, instead of being stubbed up, has been but tenderly cropped, a procedure by which its growth and spread have been promoted, unquote. That uh, footnote here, from the Trust, a sermon at the opening of the Synod of Merce and Teviotdale in the year 1721. This author alludes to the procedure of the General Assembly in the case of Mr. Simpson, Professor of Divinity at Glasgow, a few years before. Alex, we must now come to a conclusion of our review of the history of church communion, which, I hope, has been instructive. Rufus, it appears that in proportion as any church of Christ was studying faithfulness and adhering to the public scriptural profession of her faith, in judicially asserting divine truth and condemning the opposite errors, and in holding fast what she had attained, she declined sacramental communion with such as obstinately adhered to any opinion or practice contrary to her public profession. So did the ancient church, so did the reformed church in France in the beginning of the 17th century, so did the church of Scotland in her purest times. On the contrary, they who oppose the public profession of the church in any of its scriptural articles have still pleaded for a syncretism or lax communion. Witness the Arians, who continually upbraided the Orthodox with the narrowness of their terms of communion. The Arian leaders pretended that the word homousius, or consubstantial, should not be used in the church's profession concerning Christ's divinity, because it was an occasion of stumbling to the weak, and was not found in the scripture, and insisted that it should be admitted that all should be admitted to communion, who would acknowledge that the Son was not unlike the Father. Witness the Socinians, who, as Dr. Owen, in his inquiry into the original constitution of the Christian Church, observes, under a pretense of forbearance, love, and mutual toleration, do offer us the communion of their churches, wherein there is somewhat of order, wherein there is somewhat of order and discipline commendable. Yet, says he, it is unlawful to join in church communion with them on account of their pernicious errors. Witness the Arminians in Holland, who declare their willingness to hold sacramental communion with the Socinians on account of their allowing a dissent from the Socinian creed and their resolution to have no sacramental communion with the church that disallowed a dissent from her public profession. It is unlawful, said they, to live with such as brethren. They said it was Satan that first pers persuaded men to make confessions about things not precisely necessary to be known and believed for the sake of, re uh, of retaining purity, and further, they avowed that the things necessary to be known and believed are very few. Witness the established Church of England, retaining in her communion Winston and Clark, 
Wiston and Clark, excuse me, who deny the scriptural doctrine of the Trinity, and many who teach Arminian and other errors contrary to her own articles, witness the established Church of Scotland in that state of declension in which she has continued since her Erastian settlement at the Revolution in 1688, holding sacramental communion with the Episcopalians, Independents, and other sectarians, retaining in her communion as public teachers Ar Arminians and Sassinians, against whose errors she was bound by her solemnly uh, by her solemn covenant, excuse me, engagement to contend and testify. Witness the Arminian, Baxterian, and Hopkinsonian errors which now attend the fashionable practice of Catholic communion in the United States. Now there's a footnote. Some are offended by the use of such terms denoting certain systems or combinations of opinions for two reasons. One is that they prejudice people against certain opinions which, before any consideration of them, persons are led by these names to consider as erroneous, but we may as well object to the names which are given to actual sins, because each of them implies the notion of moral evil, and some of these denominations are taken from persons as simony. This presumption, instead of hindering, may invite us to the examination of the particular actions or opinions to which they are applied. The other reason against the use of these names is that they, are, that they may be, and are, sometimes misapplied. But this abuse is common to these with other general names, and the error is to be corrected by accurate definitions and enumerations on the, on the particulars excuse me, included in the signification, uh, signification of such general name. If it is asked how these particulars are to be ascertained, we answer, just as the particulars included in the meaning of other general terms are ascertained by dictionaries, grammar, history, etc. Witness the broad basis which is laid for a Catholic for a Catholic religious communion in the writings of some who, under the name of Christian ministers, are advocates for deism. Quote, unity of sentiment, says one of that fraternity, suits not the divine plan of man's moral improvement. A diversity of religion is better adapted both for mankind in general and for individuals. The most absurd and superstitious religions promote the common end of all religion, peace of conscience and practice of virtue. All religions lead to happiness, through some, though some by a shorter, safer, and less difficult road than others. Unquote. Uh, that being sketches from modern foreign writers uh, by Dr. Erskine, page 64. Alex, I cannot say that I esteem the zealots of any party. The strenuous advocate for a liturgy and the strenuous enemy of it are in danger of being alike estranged from the worship of God. The case is the same with the hot contenders for and against the singing of any other psalms of public and solemn worship than those which we have in the Old Testament. Such also in the case of the hot contenders, either for or against kneeling at the, Lord, at the Lord's table, either for or against any particular form of church government, whether it be presbytery, presbytery prelacy, or independency, either for or against keeping Christmas or Good Friday, either for or against ministers wearing a surplice when they perform divine service. Anxiety about such peculiarities becomes a substitute for the power of personal religion. Many lay more stress upon such party-coded threads of ecclesiastical faction than upon the bond of their union in Christ. We may say of these opposite things, as the apostle said of circumcision, that neither the one nor the other is anything but keeping the commandments of God. Rufus, what would you say to one who would assert that the case of the hot contenders for the worship of Jeroboam's cows, or against the changes which he made of the day of the Passover and in the priesthood, was much the same with the case of the hot contenders against these things, and that the hot contenders for the traditions of the Pharisees and the hot contenders against them were alike. 